PE, varieties of PE. I've been writhing with um, uh, PowerPoint and me. <laughs> and Bruce will tell you this is my first voyage, so I'm, I'm sort of handicapping myself to start with. Um, the slides are really just to give you, to keep you oriented on the outline. And if you find yourself staring glazed eyes and slack jawed, try and take yourself away because there's not much going on up there. <laughs> so if you look at my title, you'll see, well, you won't see, but I'll tell you, it's intentionally ambiguous. Much of uh, what follows, in fact, is about multiple possibilities, both within biology and beyond it. So, here's an overview. The key phenomenon is development, emphasizing its open-ended possibilities. Some key terms come next, starting with contingency and going on to a couple of others. And then we're going to try and put them to work a little bit on developmental and evolutionary environments and in that section, you're going to be privy to a little bit of intramural squabbling, you might say. And then finally, we turn to sustainability. But sustainability understood not only in its usual context of um, economics and, uh, and ecology, but also in ontogeny and phylogeny themselves. <laughs> These last, ontogeny and phylogeny, include symbiotic associations, for which, of course, Lynn Margulis is a prime reference point. She and I didn't cross, uh, cross paths very often, generally through Linda's farm meetings, but our approaches to the living world, uh, I would say, had some commonality. A respect for complex dynamics, for example, at multiple levels. An affection for systems of wildly heterogeneous parts. And what might be politely called a revisionist attitude towards certain boundaries. Indeed, in their 2002 book, Acquiring Genomes, a wonderful title, she and Dorian took a wonderful poke at the innate acquired dichotomy, which was, in fact, my bête noire for decades. Environments at various scales were also very important to Lynn's work on symbiosis and on Gaia alike. So we will spend some time just thinking about how to conceive environments. Also pivotal, I would say, are biological flexibility, and inventiveness. Thick, our single-celled ancestors endured engulfment, invasion, each organism environment to the other. And cobbling together the sometimes quite fanciful ways of cohabitating, they made life's history while going about their modest but intrepid ways. Lynn and I never compared notes on any of this, on our common interests, for example. But I will tell you that in these years of appreciation of her work, um, there was always astonishment, and there was always admiration, but also maybe a modicum of fellow feeling. So, development. Notice, it doesn't actually appear in our symposium title, but I hope you'll agree that it connects all the terms. Earth, life, system, environment, evolution. Organisms develop with, as well as in, environments. And one way of expanding our usual narrow gene-based definition of evolution is to see it as change in ways of changing, changes in ways of developing. To think that way, though, we need a really ample concept of development. 
that's unconstrained by the internalism that has historically characterized notions of the <coughs> It needs to be an idea that takes in a lifespan, doesn't just stop at maturity, say, or reproduction, and also one that integrates environments induced symbiotically into its very workings. Enter the developmental system, GS. For me, this is a target entity, usually an organism, but I think this style of thinking can be applied at lower and higher levels. It's that target entity and developmentally relevant aspects of its surround. And I was struck when, maybe it was Bruno, uh, pointed out that the definition of the ecosystem was a definition that explicitly included biotic and abiotic elements. Basically, coeval, coeval setting. I would say that's, that characterizes a developmental system as well. So this isn't an organism and modifiers from the outside, or deflectors from the outside. Something is part of the DS then, if it, influ if it influences the organism's development. Again, very broadly concerned, uh, conceived, developed. One of these interactions is the organism itself, as could be seen in the quote that was just read to you. The organism contributing to its own development. Because environments are part of development itself, my, my, my claim is that this notion really does undo the nature-nurture dichotomy, while it also highlighting all kinds of phenomena that are minimized by the standard framework, including, for example, epigenetic inheritance, symbioses, and development itself. The importance of the relationships between the last two, in fact, between development and symbiosis, apparently can't be uh, overstated. We're learning more and more about the role of symbiotic um, interactions with the most fundamental of developmental processes. Oh, we did developmental systems. Okay. A DS lacks clear boundaries. It's in constant transformation. Within the organism, there are subsystems, things like metabolic cycles, perhaps, organ, neural circuits. Often these are analytically tractable, but they're still connected to the outside. Despite variation in conditions, though, development is famously robust. Take two simple patterns, paths converging on or diverging from a point. Let those stand for redundancy and ambiguity. These are kinds of schematics of developmental plasticity. Um, regularity can be due, not to exact repetition, but to flexible processes in which several paths can converge on the same result or return to the same result if deflected. Developmentalists, for example, talk about catch-up or equifinality, in which there's some kind of compensation for deprivation, for example, or some kind of disturbance. In these cases, then, what you have is diverse pathways that can be equivalent with respect to the gross phenotype that results. Predictable results, then, should be distinguished from the specific causal contingencies that allow them. Or, to anticipate a point that we're going to come back to later, we shouldn't assume that regular outcomes are always produced by the same processes. There may be redundancy in play. So there's the little schematic of several pathways 
ending up at the same point. Now, what's the same point obviously depends on what level you look at, right? what scale you examine this on. Pathway, uh, sorry, developmental systems lose jointedness contributes to their resilience and their vulnerability. So pathways can diverge radically from the same starting point as internal or external conditions vary. Species, for example, may have several distinct forms. Think of many uh, insect casts. You also find continuous variation. This is a kind of developmental ambiguity, one-to-many mapping. And it's, a, it's very easy to think of lots of other examples. Consider the possible effects that you might get from giving a drug to various people at various times and various conditions. Thalidomide's ambiguous mapping was quite grim, in fact. The pregnant women who took this drug for morning sickness during pregnancy, during the period when their embryo's limbs were forming, were not themselves harmed, as far as I know. But their babies might be born with flipper-like arms and legs, a condition called phocomelia, which means seal limbs. Um, Thomas Kwastoff has just retired from singing on the stage. And he, I believe, uh, was someone who had been affected by um, his mom's taking thalidomide. But phocomelia is also associated with a genetic variant. Okay? So when you have phenocopying, a variant gene, and some kind of external, uh, external agent can be associated with the same phenotype. So here, we actually have both ambiguity and redundancy. So standard genotypes and thalidomide both have multiple effects, if you start against some standard background. And you have diverse ontogenetic paths leading to the same phenotype, the phocomelia phenotype. So this is a hugely oversimplified way of just getting you to, you to consider developmental plasticity when we talk about <coughs> development and evolution. There's been a lot of work on developmental plasticity in evolutionists, I'm sure some of you are aware. Um, this has to do with the idea that there are environmental changes that unmask um, hitherto hidden genetic variation by altering development. Mary Jane West Everhard has been hugely energetic and obstinate in describing and documenting this phenomenon. But there are lots of people who have been working on it, and it actually is an older idea that dates, among others, to Waddington. So the claim here is that there's developmental buffering or canalization that produces the species common phenotype despite a fair amount of genetic or environmental variation. Uh, so there is the redundancy. Okay? Catalyzation's redundant mapping minimizes gross phenotypic variation. So, as I said, <coughs> genetic variants can accumulate silently in the population. This is this is the whole scenario. These silent variations, however, can be developmentally engaged should the environment change in such a way that there needs to be some kind of developmental adjustment if the organism is to survive. So you have phenotypic novelties engaging a new set uh, of elements from the genotype. Then you see you might have novel morphology, or physiology, or behavior, or any combination of those. This, in turn, then, shifts natural selection. So that a process that starts with developmental flexibility can, in this story, lead to genetic change in a population. 
um, which for many people is what really counts in evolution. That's the only thing that counts in evolution. I'm not one of those people, but it's important that some people will be convinced by that. I would note, however, that at the same time, previously invo uh, uninvolved environmental factors, both internal and external, will be unmasked as well, and also can feed novel developmental pathways. A shift in intracellular processes tweaks immediate neighbor environment, our relations, for example, and gene interactions, of course, are very common. Altered phenotypes may have altered effective environments. Relevant environments depend on the organism. And while the plasticity literature is really quite heavily comparative, the word also refers to change in, in individual organisms. So even the most predictable ontogenetic sequence is plastic change in an organism. The progressive unmasking and obscuring of internal and external interactions. Notice that each time this happens, the ground for further events shifts. The landscape is always changing. I would say development just is more or less ordered plasticity. Constraints uh, and possibilities arise as previously silent factors are brought into play and others change their roles or simply drop out. In contemporary evolutionary discourse, development has classically been termed an internal constraint on the shaping power of natural selection. So you have a quite familiar, I think, internal, external opposition. You have this shaping force from the outside and you've got this sort of obstinate development inside. In plasticity studies, on the other hand, <coughs> developmental robustness itself becomes a fount of evolutionary diversity. So there's a little table turning here. A DS is a system of contingencies with interactants, not all of which are benign, appearing and dropping out as relations shift and the target entity shifts with them. This continues over a lifetime. And in evolution, patterns of developmental change are themselves transformed as multitudes of organism and environment complexes carve their interacting trajectories through space and time. Think about the word contingency. One of its principal meanings is of chance or unpredictability. In biology, it's often associated with environments. Accidents of development, for example, are sources of abnormality or quirk. While those of evolutionary environments stem from the vagaries of natural selection, whose challenges must be met or else. But the main meaning for us today will be causal dependency. What uncertainty there is, notice I'm not denying uncertainty, but I'm going to say what uncertainty there is doesn't necessarily attach to external interactors, but instead arises from the linked dependencies that compose the system. These multiscale contingencies are the source of both variation and regularity. For, for Margulis and Sagan, 1995, life is, quote, the ingenuity to make the most of contingency, to make animals, for example, out of a botched attempt at cannibalism." End quote. Our temporal and, and spatial scales, however, do have to keep, uh, be kept straight. And it's, it's quite easy to get disoriented, I think. Think about maternal effects on offspring. They may only be evident in adulthood. 
So if you're not looking then, you're not going to see them. If you're looking earlier, you may not see them. Traces of an unusual interaction may be discerned suborganismically, but not in the gross phenotype. So sameness and difference themselves depend on how and when you look. With respect to predictability, then, contingency swings both ways. That double face of contingency is worth remembering because both construction and interaction, which we examine next, have been found mainly on the environmental or nurture side of the nature-nurture debate and the associated culture wars. But consider, a nurture that's nothing more than nature's mirror image is a poor thing. <coughs> Pesky, but poor. It gives us exchanges in which environmental influence means constructed and therefore arbitrary or social and so not biological, or even acquired and thus not really real. A biological construction is interactive, altering both the organism and its affected environments. And that means that natures are moving products of ontogeny, made and remade in the processes of developmental nurture. Oh, we already said that. Okay. <laughs> One of my first academic talks many, many years ago was called Transmission and Construction. And in that talk I argued that the language of trade transmission, as absolutely standard as it is, is really quite mischievous. What it does effectively is it reduces the periodic ontogeny of traits to genetic transfer and implies that this, the kind of direct mapping of the old slogan, one gene, one phenotype, or one gene, one enzyme. There was a little set of these mappings. This collapse of organisms' features into genes for them seems innocent. Everybody does it. And after all, we're told that the DNA carries the traits and makes the organisms, so what's the problem? One potential problem is that it tends to screen off development and construction and its environment. It amounts, in fact, to a biological synecdoche but one on steroids. A tiny part not only stands for the whole, or vice versa, but builds it as well. Now this invests a macromolecule, as marvelous as, as that molecule may be, with the generative powers of an entire developmental system, while the phenotype becomes its mere expression. If the trait in question is producible in several ways, however. The gene for it might not <coughs> be involved in its production in any particular case. Other genes may be involved, or as in phenocopying, the fact that it makes the crucial difference may come from the outside. Hence, my message is that, um, as I said in that early talk, Interactants are transmitted. Traits have to be developmentally constructed. Transmission in this rather larger context is what you get. And you get not just genes, and not just, not even sort of some kind of abstract information that goes beaming down the germline, but you get a miscellany of ontogenetic influences, resources becoming available through concrete processes at various times. What counts is that the effective, not necessarily replicated, that the effective interactants be at hand when and where they can alter development. 
or affect development. So it can be also be to sustain uh, a state or trajectory. And you want to know what's their impact. How do they turn out? How reliably? On what does their availability depend? So there's a kind of centrifugal direction of the question. You question, question the conditions and then question the conditions for the conditions. Still, some people would uh, stand up for trade transmission as a standard scientific shorthand. Patterns of genotype, phenotype, correlation, say. Certainly, there are many such context-specific associations. Both their regularity and their variability, <coughs> however, I would tend to place in the DS frame. So, the stability that invites people to use transmission talk is achieved partly because environments are deeply involved in development, not because they're irrelevant. Shorthand has its place. I don't want to legislate language in the lab, or at least not entirely. But this synecdoche uh, tends to imply a kind of simple correspondence between traits and formative processes. That's part of the mischief of the transmission metaphor. And insofar as it does that, it reinforces and is reinforced by rather impoverished views of ontogeny. Construction in DST, developmental systems theory, is ontogenetic making without pre-existing plans. And this does away with the pre-formationism of trade transmission. Biologists' use of construction metaphors stems very largely from critiques of adaptationism. I'm talking about sort of modern, relatively recent years. Um, the critiques by dialectical biologist Richard Lewinton and his various co-authors. One difficulty with this notion of construction is that it's not easily referable to the makings of everyday life, of the kitchen, say, or the workshop. According to Peter Godfrey Smith and Dennis Walsh, two philosophers, it has a causal sense and a constitutive sense. These are not mutually exclusive, and the distinction is often made in treatments of construction without being named as such. Still, explicit discussion can be useful, and we will return to it after a few words here. Causal construction, I think, is not a problem. It's relatively straightforward. You think about development, uh, developmental impact on organisms or the way they alter their surroundings, making nests, moving soil, drilling wells. The constitutive sense is a bit more subtle and probably more distinctive. It's absolutely central to DST thinking. And it appears to my references to um, uh, relevant environments or effective environments, the organism's characteristics, behavior, constitute aspects of its surroundings as its, as, as its environments. Constitutive construction underlines the ways that organismic particularities render the world threatening, audible, toxic, navigable, and so on developmentally relevant. So think of the moment when a, an infant starts to cruise, you know, this delightful time when they pull themselves up on any available object or body part and, and sidle along. At that moment, their world changes. They are, they are subject to physical forces that they are not used to dealing with. They command attention in a different way from adults who may be around. Uh, objects appear that were absent before. Doggy ears. <laughs> so you, they will also become um, the objects of canine attention if necessary. These are the kinds of moment-to-moment -moment changes in a world, 
and in a way of interacting with the world that I'd like to highlight. Constitutive relations like these, then, can suggest how, why, and whether causal interactions occur. No snippet of DNA enters into development or construction unless it's made relevant by, constituted as physical environment to, certain other interactions. Now, it may seem odd to refer to DNA as environment, but system components are environment to each other. And if a stretch of DNA belong to the operative neighborhood of certain molecules, it may become involved in the making of a product. A transcribable sequence, that is, becomes a gene, or becomes part of a gene, only in context, and only after much snipping and stitching, in many cases, some of uh, the marvels of which you were told about earlier today. Under different circumstances, that same sequence could become part of another gene. Geneticist Wes Jackson defines a gene as one or more stretches of DNA with the context that allows transcription. So you have almost a mini DS there. It's the entity <coughs> and its relevant environment. Now that's an odd term, usually considered the prime movers of development. Genes begin to sound, in this kind of narrative, like its products, coming into being through interactions of diverse factors and then entering into furthers, uh, further ones that may produce a complex that can make a protein. Closely related to this notion of construction is interaction. And it, too, retains whiffs of chanciness from the nature-nurture complex. Now, as um, was mentioned a minute ago, I've rolled it into my own term, constructivist interaction, which sometimes I'm sorry I did. I don't know. I, in any case, I do share Richard Leventon's and Richard Lewington's mistrust of that word. They don't like interaction. 